Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Um, the next session is called the and discussion of unofficial response to animals uh, in disasters focused um, on the US. And um, our guest speakers are Adam Parascandola from the Humane Society International and Dick Green, the ultimate DM expert. Tim Persful was supposed to join us as well from American Humane Association, but he was deployed to Guam as most of um, <clears throat> experts um, do. Um, a few uh, housekeeping issues for those of, of you who are uh, joining us for the first time to, uh, to uh, listen to this, to these experts. The Zoom feature has been disabled but you can place your questions uh, in the question and answer feature, and we will try to um, answer them at the end. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captions in case you would like to hear the presentation in your language. And we encourage you to use the <clears throat> the uh, the, the uh, hashtag JADM's conference for Twitter and other social media. And as a reminder, the video recording will not be available until it has been edited and released later this year. So without further delay, I leave you with uh, in the expert hands of Adam and Dick. You, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning, good evening, which, whichever time zone you're in. Um, as Gerardo said, uh, well, I'm Adam Periscadola, uh, the vice president of the animal rescue team, and I'll be presenting with Dick Green, who is, um, as Gerardo sort of alluded to, quite a legend in the field of disaster response, both within the U.S. and, and globally. And um, we're going to try to do a quick presentation, just go through some some conversation about this issue. As as you've seen, it's it's pretty. Um, it's a it's a theme kind of throughout the conference of the this unofficial response to animals and disasters and so um i'm going to kick it over to dick to start us off um and then at the end we hope you guys will join us in in with your own experiences and weigh in a little bit perfect adam you know i think our first lesson learned was never do animation when you are having somebody else click the buttons but if you'll bear with me we'll get through this and I think you guys have seen this first slide, or at least this first uh, verbiage a thousand times, and that is all disasters occur locally and are managed locally unless they're delegated. And, you know, that delegation can be part and parcel. Um, a local animal control may say that they need help for sheltering or they may need help for search and rescue. Um, but typically, and we'll just go ahead and add them and hit that next one. You can hit them all if you want. I don't care. Typically, in most jurisdictions, that authority resides with animal control. And we re often refer to that in the U.S. as the authority having jurisdiction or sometimes the agency having jurisdiction. Now, you know, Adam lives down in the southwest corner of Washington State. I'm on the rural side almost at the, at the start of the pass going up into eastern Washington. So there are many places in the state of Washington, as I'm sure there are cases in, in uh, some of the other more rural states where animal control may be, uh, you know, probably contracted with a humane society or some other animal welfare group. So it's not always animal control, which is what I'm trying to say is. And so it just kind of depends, but it will either be delegated or it will be assigned to some agency, and that agency is the group that must request you to come in. Now, if that agency gets overwhelmed, whether it be at the county, parish, or borough level, um, the very first thing that they have to do is to exhaust all of their agreements that they have in place. And typically, I shouldn't say that, many counties uh, and parishes across the United States have agreements with either local um, agencies or national agencies such as, as, as Adams Group, um, and they will activate those. And typically what that does, go ahead, Adam, is that they will go up to their emergency operations center and they'll say, hey, I want to activate my MAA with X group, and I want them to do the, the following functions. And emergency management then will typically, it depends upon what state you're in, 
and how big the disaster is, but typically they'll go to the state and say, I need a tasking number so that I can develop a mission assignment for this group that's gonna come in and assist us. And that tasking number then is your invitation to come in and that assignment then will say, we want you here by such and such a time. We want you to perform the following activities. You'll be under the command and control of this group and we're expecting you for X number of days. So it's a fairly specific process in the United States that allows groups to come in and work somewhat seamlessly within the incident management system. But once again, whether that group is coming in either at the county level or at the state level, and, and let me backtrack just for a second. Prior to retirement, I was with the ASPCA, and there are many uh, counties and parishes where I would have an agreement with that county, and I'd also have an agreement with the state. And I may get requested to come in from both. Regardless of which, I'm, which way I'm coming in, either at the state level or at the county level, I still typically work for animal control. Go ahead, Anna. If you do not have that mission assignment, if you do not have that tasking number, you're considered rogue. And there are all kinds of different titles in the United States that we've assigned these groups of in, either groups or individuals that have responded without that uh, specific request to support. And, and, you know, you could tag a whole bunch of different names to them. I'm gonna just say SUV, they're spontaneous. Uh, we haven't requested them, but they're volunteers and they want to go to work. And I put them into three categories. The first category is that well-intentioned, big-hearted individual. Research has shown that it's typically a female between 25 and 40, middle, middle income, married, and has children. Interesting, isn't it? Those individuals will drop whatever they're doing. They'll pack their car. Sometimes they'll do a food drive before they go. They'll get everything into their SUV, not to be confused with our SUVs, and they'll drive for two days straight with their 16-year-old daughter to come down and help you. Very well-intentioned, big-hearted, lovely people. I want to go out and hug them all. So that's our first category, easily managed, by the way, in most cases. The second category of these groups that are maybe spontaneous and not requested is an interesting group. They're usually aligned somehow with government and they can be from another animal welfare agency. Um, they could be with maybe a different volunteer group and they show up at your doorstep and they oftentimes go outside of the scope of authority that you've assigned them. And so you may have a group that was assigned to sheltering doing search and rescue or a group that's been assigned for medical care doing search and rescue. So those are that second category, once again, fairly easy to manage with the right attitude and the right approach. The third group is the group that's given me all this gray hair. And these are that those groups that sit by the TV and watch the monitors, and they're looking for storms, they're looking for fires, they're looking for a reason to deploy. They're adrenaline junkies. They oftentimes come very well equipped. They have a lot of cool stuff. They look really neat. They have these great brand new boots on. They've got their BDUs on. They're usually dressed in kind of dark colors. They've got a really cool SUV or a big ass truck. Excuse my French. Um, and these group, this is the group that really is the most concerning uh, because they will do anything that they can to be activated or to be active in the field, including lying to emergency management, going around emergency management, getting into areas that they shouldn't be. And all of that makes it very difficult for emergency management to keep track of them. Accountability is very difficult when you don't know where people are. You don't know how to reach them. You don't know really what they're even doing. They don't know, these groups that are self-deploying don't know where the safety lines are. They don't know what waters have been contaminated. They are not, they haven't shown up to your briefing in the morning. They don't have a copy of the IAP. So accountability is very difficult and maintaining their safety is very difficult. And then of course, we have a whole host of legal issues 
Adam, I don't know how many cases came out from Katrina. You're going to talk about that in just a minute, I know. But, you know, last time I heard there were at least 30 that actually went to trial. And most of them were because people, and they were these rogue groups, not under the command and control, were going into people's yards and trespassing, stealing a dog, and then shipping the dog across state lines. So there are a whole host of legal issues that if we had more time, we could get into. But here's the thing that I really hope we all walk away from this with. And that is in each one of those cases, in all three categories, we've missed an amazing opportunity. And that is to enhance our own response capability by bringing these people into our fold. Not always easy, but certainly something that we'll talk about here in the next couple of slides. Go ahead, Adam. Okay, oops, sorry, I'm trying to get this to, there we go. Oh, get that Katrina picture up. Okay, yeah, so we thought we'd go through some examples and and just before I start, um, I noticed the, the Q&A um, is also, besides asking questions, you'll see when we get to the end, you know, so if you guys are thinking ahead or wanna type ahead of, of we're, we're we really are eager to hear from other folks as well, like your experience with these sort of, you know, unofficial volunteers, or if you have volunteered in this capacity, um, you know, or, you know, um, you'll see there's some questions at the end, but, uh, you know, please feel free to put that in the Q&A, even if it's not a question, if it's just a kind of um, example. So, yeah, Hurricane Katrina, um, was uh was was actually probably my my first big disaster response now almost in a couple of years we'll be going on 20 years hard to believe since Katrina um and you know I think this was also you know the first response where you know there was so many of sort of these SUVs that showed up at the time there weren't there were like groups, but it was a lot of individuals that showed up. And so for those of you who may not know the whole situation, when when New Orleans, um, particular, there's a particular problem in New Orleans, because when the levees broke, they evacuated the city. Now, when I say evacuated, of course, there were people that chose to stay in their in their homes and there were areas of the city that were not flooded, like around the French Quarter and other places. But basically the city was evacuated it was all of these law enforcement agencies national guard came in and kind of like took over and and they had checkpoints for people going into the city um because they were trying to limit that and then let people in slowly to get their belongings and things like that so a lot of people uh people were forced to leave without their animals and so um the louisiana spca was the ahj at the time right the the authority having jurisdiction and they um they worked with a number of groups hsus humans of the united states was one of them and um that's who who i went i went in under um and you know there were a lot of problems that occurred and as as dick kind of alluded to i mean the first was that there were like a lot of people who had zero experience in disasters zero experience really handling animals they had got in because they had realized that if they you know sort of wrote on their vehicles laspca that that, that they were being allowed in at the beginning there really wasn't any credentialing or ids later on they did make these little id cards to try to control this and so it was first and foremost a safety issue because um these people were sort of running around the city nobody knew they were there was, you know there were there were um reports of people going missing you know i think in the end everybody was accounted for but somebody would panic because their friend went in and and they didn't know where they were they didn't know what happened nobody knew what they were doing nobody knew where they were going and so you know safety wise it was it was a huge issue um and then the other part of that was, as Dick said, there were both individuals and groups that were going in and taking animals that they assumed needed to be rescued. So, for example, um, uh, I ran into one person who was, as understandably, very angry because they had gone to the store and when they came back, their dogs had been rescued from their yard 
And um, there were a lot of issues with Katrina, a lot of lessons learned in, in, in the animals. Some did go through the official process, but even that was very complicated because about 15,000 animals went through Lamar Dixon, which was the center. And um, the tracking wasn't always great, unfortunately. So people's animals would get sent off somewhere and tracking them down and, and trying to find where they went was really difficult. But then there were also groups that were taking animals and just removing them back to their facility in whichever state they're from without ever putting them on pet finder or into the system. And so there was a whole team um, at HSUS that spent months and months trying to track down where people's animals had gone. And it was, it was, you know, it was a huge mess really. And, um, and you know, it, I mean, I'll be honest, it got to the point that, uh, you know, we would try to, if we rescued an animal that was on a list, there was a list of requests from people who were giving you permission, asking you to go to their house and get their animal. We would try to just contact them and see, could we meet them somewhere rather than taking them in through the shelter system because it was so overwhelmed at the time and it would be a long time for them to kind of get, get their animals back. So um, yeah, that was my first experience. I had never seen anything like that. All of these people coming in and just sort of taking animals. And um, yeah, it was, I think, a real wake up call for uh, on a number of fronts for a lot of the animal groups. Um, but also definitely, you know, the the law enforcement agencies that were there, I think, realized, as I said, later on, I, I, I did, I was there right at the beginning, and then I took a break, and then I came back. And when I came back, they were printing badges for people. And so there was a huge volunteer. So people could be incorporated into the system. They were accepting volunteers, both at Lamar Dixon. You can imagine there, there would be sometimes 2000 animals at one time at, the, at that facility. And so they were accepting people could come and volunteer, you know, just show up and, and they would train them and volunteer. Uh, it was a little trickier about who they were letting into the city, but yeah, it took them a little while to get control of it. So um, Okay, um, we so, better we better pick this up, or we're gonna yeah, get we're yeah. Done. Let me let me get to fires real quickly, and I'll try to just hum through this so you can get to Maria because I'm excited to hear about that as well. But you know, there's something about fires that just attracts people like like mosquitoes to me on a on a hike. But I uh, I think it's the sexy part of it, the allure of getting behind fire lines. And as you can see from the picture that I selected, this was Lake County in 2016. The Mendocino complex was the largest fire in California state history at the time with just a measly half million acres, right? 2020, the, the August complex destroyed that with over a million acres. Uh, but there is something about fires that really attracts rogue groups. And it, it's really, I think, that allure. And it's not only the folks that want to get in behind lines, but it's also those well-intentioned groups that have some amazing equipment that we would love to use such as that horse trailer that you see in front of us right there. But uh, so we really, you know, I, I think I spent as much time in the last five, six, seven, eight fires that I did uh, chasing out these road groups as I did uh, fighting for or at least taking care of animals that were impacted by the fire. And, and of course, many of us on this in this group and many of the folks that are attending, I'm sure the sessions were part of the campfire in 2018 uh, which is probably going to hold many of the records in California for a little while anyway. Uh, most number of deaths, I think under 90, about 86 people died. The most number of structures, I think around 19,000, if I remember correctly. Uh, I don't know how many animals went through the sheltering system. I think I heard one time that maybe 4,000 came through. Uh, we were at 1,500 to 2,000 at the time that I was there. Uh, so there are going to be a large number of records by that camp fire, but it's also going to probably be a record for the number of problems that they had with trying to embrace uh, a number of different rescue groups that wanted to be involved. It's the point, finally, where emergency management just threw their arms up and said, embrace them all. So we'll we'll keep moving on because we got to watch our time. So if you want to talk about Maria, uh, I'll come back with Sandy. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk real quickly about Maria. I think it was a, a little different situation being an island for one thing. It wasn't, wasn't as easy to get to, especially because the commercial airport was closed for quite some time. Um, but, you know, one of the 
the big issues that we encountered during Maria was that um, there were there are quite a number of groups that work on transporting animals. And so like on, on a regular basis, transporting dogs out of Puerto Rico up to the mainland. And so there was um, a lot of people that had like their own planes or private planes. And, and you know, we even learned a lesson ourselves, I think, at, at HSUS because we did fly out, I think, <laughs> close to, I mean, thousands of dogs during this process. And, and um, you know, these were from shelters that already had the animals pre-storm, supposedly, but, you know, there were instances, I think, where there is some corner, corner cutting, cutting corners, um, you know, in terms of making sure these animals were in good health and were disease free that are now being transported to, you know, often join other shelter populations in the U.S. And, you know, we know this kind of mass evacuation is, is you know, if it's a fire or something where the animals have to get out of the danger zone, that's one thing, but this kind of mass transport really isn't a solution for, um, you know, disaster response and recovery. And, um, you know, there were instances where animals with diseases were transported. There were instances where animals perhaps were, were, taken in, found after the storm, and were transported off the island too quickly without giving their folks time to, um, you know, to to find them and reclaim them. And so this is this is a problem we've seen consistently, actually, on island responses, often like in the Bahamas is, 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 is groups coming in and taking out animals and again, not putting them through the system and not really checking, you know, the, the, the ways that people relate and live with their animals can be very different in, 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 in different settings. And so there are a lot of dogs that roam, but they are what some places call them doorstop step dogs or, you know, and so they are animals that essentially are claimed by someone, but they don't live necessarily in their home the way that 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 we see them in in many you know countries like um, the mainland in the U.S., for example. Um, and there's oftentimes a mistake where people come in and they think, oh, these animals aren't owned; nobody cares about them or has a claim on them, and they transport them out. And there actually are people that care. So that was an issue we saw there. Well, we saved Sandy for last, even though we kind of got out of chronological order here. Um, and I did that purposely because I, I think that there were some very unique features about Sandy. First off, as far as I can remember, it was the first time we put that label on a storm of super storm, right? Remember that super storm, Sandy? It was an interesting storm. I think at its peak, we got over a thousand miles wide. Think about that from the Canada border down to San Francisco in terms of width. So it was truly a massive storm. You know, it hit uh, Cuba as a cat three, kind of dissipated, and then it hit Bahamas, and then it raked itself all the way up the Atlantic coast. Just an amazing storm. Uh, you know, it, it kind of lost its steam out in the Atlantic, but then it came back uh, really just really close to Atlantic City, as I remember, uh, as a cat one. And of course it hit, a major metropolitan area of New York City. I was with ASPCA at the time. Interestingly, all of our team was running a half marathon in Southern California at the same time. We're watching the news thinking, I'm sure we can get back. And we didn't. So we had to go into Atlanta or somewhere around it and drive in to make sure we we're there at time. But having a disaster happen in your backyard really helps because then you can throw all the resources in the world at it. And we did. Uh, from search and rescue in New Jersey to sheltering, transport, you name it, we were doing it. But the reason I saved Sandy for last was for two unique features of Sandy. The first one was, I believe, it was the first time that an NGO was assigned federal resources in the form of the National Veterinary Response Team, Invert, and it worked perfectly, flawlessly. They were able to get in all of the responders. They did an amazing job of providing that consistent care that we needed and working within the incident command structure. And the second reason that Sandy was unique, in my humble opinion, was, and, and quite frankly, we could probably thank the Joplin resource or the Joplin response in Missouri, huge tornado in Missouri. Uh, one of the major lessons learned in that response was how important it was to manage uh, these SUVs that just showed up. 
So ASPCA put together, or the, and specifically the resource unit, they, they deserve all the kudos for this. They put together a just-in-time training and every volunteer that came to us, whether it came from the Mayor's Alliance, any of the New York City-based volunteer groups, our own volunteers, or just somebody off the street, the first thing that he did is went through a PowerPoint orientation that kind of showed, well, this is the operation, this is what we're doing, the big picture, and then every single response part, whether they were washing dishes, taking care of dogs, or changing cat litter, was all on a, on a job sheet. And so they could do it in a consistent and, and well-organized way. And it was our way of managing those volunteers and taking advantage of all of these well-intentioned people and putting them into the response instead of pushing them away. So that takes us to our last segment. We wanna hear from you on what you have done to embrace these folks. First off, I'm sure you all, I don't know how many people are on the call, but I'm sure many of you would want to talk about the road group that showed up in your backyard. We don't necessarily want to go there. Where we want to go is we want to learn from you on what you have done, what steps you have taken so that you have learned how to embrace these SUVs. So Adam, if you'll advance that slide. And I'm going to start with the local group, the, the authority having jurisdictions. Go ahead, one more, just so they see both. Can you tell us what you have done um, to enhance your response capabilities? And hopefully we won't get crickets here because if we get crickets, we're gonna make Gerardo speak or something. Right? Yeah. Well, I think people have to type it in. I don't think that they can oh. unmute, you know, so they'll have to type into the Q and A um, because it's a webinar. Yeah, I don't think they can join in the discussion if I'm right. Um, Adam well, and um, Nick, could you, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but could you um, say a few words, uh, discuss the NARSC coalition? Um, yeah, yeah. also, I yeah, thanks, Gerardo. I was going to say, and also there's a question about NVOAD. So, Dick, I thought you probably can answer this more, okay. more history than I can. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I'll try to be quick. NARSC is a group that I started right after Hurricane Katrina, and, and we basically started that because we saw that many of the national responding groups, even though they were invited to attend, did not really understand incident command, and they really didn't understand the various functions within the incident command system. So the initial uh, kind of the goal for NARSC was to really make sure that all of the folks from the NGO side had that basic understanding of incident command and control. It evolved over the first year into something much bigger than and, and more of what it is today. And that is a collaborative effort to make sure that all of the national groups are working well together and they do. Uh, they meet quarterly. Uh, Tim Percival, unfortunately, is not with us today. He'll be with you later on, but the time zones didn't match with his Guam time. Uh, he is the current chair. Um, uh, we've a number of us have taken a couple of different shots at being the chair, uh, but really what happens is that when there is a disaster, NARSC immediately meets. They oftentimes meet with that responding or that impacted state or not the county, but primarily the state, and they say, how can we help? And let us know the best way, and we're not going to set foot on your turf unless you invite us and unless you tell us exactly what you'd want us to do. So it's an amazing alliance. And it's really the only alliance that's recognized by the federal government. How's that, Adam? Good enough? Yeah, I think that's great. And I will just say that the, the other thing about the NARSC now when there is a big a big response is that even though the NARSC coalition is, is a limited number of groups, they will open those coordination calls up to other Groups, not, you know, even groups like exactly. Greater Good, right, who who are, you know, providing resources, but not necessarily on the ground. So it's really helped greatly to kind of coordinate even folks that aren't in the coalition to coordinate with the coalition on the work. Yeah. And then do you want me to do Envo Ed real quick? Sure. Yeah. Envo There's a question on Envo Ed in the question. So the, so. the Envo Ed is an amazing organization that helps facilitate groups to come in and respond. 
Unfortunately, on the animal side, now HSUS is a member of NVOAD. NARSC has a, an affiliate membership with NVOAD. Uh, so it's been very difficult to date to get more national animal welfare groups involved at the NVOAD level uh, so that they can work with that group um, on a more regular basis. But we at least now have that relationship with one national group and with NARSC within VOAD, so there's better communication going on. Yeah, yeah, great. And there was a question, I think, about, um, let's see, sorry, I'm going to go back here, uh, methods and procedures for attracting more efficiable and official and trainable volunteerism, such as providing training opportunities and possibilities of developing a rapid screening protocol for volunteers during the critical time. Um, and I was just going to mention real quick that, you know, one thing that has also come about in the U.S. quite a lot, which, you know, has existed for a long time in certain states such as Florida and um, has a really active one, are SARTs or CARTs, right, which are state animal response teams or county animal response teams. And so there are a number of, you know, areas where there was an identification that having a pool of trained volunteers was going to be very helpful. I mean, of course, each each jurisdiction or animal control or, or humane society itself will have their volunteers, but this is a team that's really dedicated towards just responding to um, disaster in that county or that state, and um, they can be a really valuable resource. Just for example, in the floods in Vermont, there's a very active state animal response team there, and they actually were able to, the Red Cross had co-located shelters, right, where they had a little area in an adjacent building, say, where animals were housed and their their people were housed, um, you know, kind of in an adjacent building, and they, they, they were able to provide the support for the care of those animals so that, you know, national groups didn't have to respond there. And um, so that's a really good way to try to set up and have trained volunteers and then try to direct people to that. Dick, I don't know if you have any words on the kind of like just-in-time training as well. You know, well, I think you brought up a really good point, Adam, and that is the situation in Florida. Florida deserves all kinds of kudos as well. They have a very unique situation where they have a coalition and they call it SARC, uh, State Animal Resource Coalition, where they've pretty much vetted all of the various individual response groups. And then they have a SART, a state animal response team, and they work beautifully together. It, it really is a model that many states could learn a lot from. When you go to Florida, you will notice that there is just such a nice relationship between those local rescue groups and the state organizing group. Uh, and so more states need to kind of look at that to make sure that everyone is on the same page when they respond. Now, the SART and the CART in various states have really helped that situation, but recent research that we conducted here a couple of years ago is, is showing that we don't have enough states with that structure in place. Yeah, okay. There's one one more question, which which I'm happy to take, Dick. It's, a, it's a slightly, it's basically a question about spontaneous volunteers in man-made disasters, meaning like cruelty, neglect, animal fighting. Uh, where there's an investigative component and how do we utilize those folks without compromising a case. So, I mean, generally, um, you know, we, we I'll, I'll be honest, like we have a big pool of, of, of volunteers and of sort of part-time responders that we pay as they, uh, uh, when they come out, right? They're not full-time staff, but we pay them to come when we have like a case. Um, I think, you know, there are instances where we bring in local volunteers or volunteers through the local jurisdiction. And, um, you know, the one thing I'll say is like having a very strong NDA, right, a non-disclosure agreement that everyone must sign. But we're, we're usually very, very cautious, to be honest, about we, we never bring spontaneous volunteers into the field and into the onto the property, of course, because that's under a law enforcement search warrant, usually very particular about who goes in there. But but. But potentially, if you're housing and if you're a smaller group that needs help, you know, housing the animals, then after the fact, once you have them and caring for them, I think there are ways to do it. Uh, we have very, very strict no photograph policy. You know, um, um, you know, if we see you taking pictures with your cell phone that, you know, 
um, you know, that's it. You know, <laughs> you're going to have to leave. Um, we make folks sign, like pretty much sign their life away on the NDA, right? That they're not going to post or say anything. It's, there's definitely a risk, but sometimes it can't be avoided, right? Because um, if, if your agency just does not have the resources to care for, say, 200 cats or something, you know, you do have to open it up to outside volunteers, you know, um, um, potentially new recruit new volunteers. So I would just say having a very strong NDA and a very strong, clear policy that's communicated to everyone about no communication, no photographs um, of the animals. Gents, before, uh, before while I have you uh, online, I'd like to ask a question because I could not type it. Um, if you, uh, I don't know if you agree that uh, people, folks that volunteer do that on the back of uh, a perceived lack of um, support for animals from the officials or from uh, civil defense authorities or, or, uh, or whomever is in charge. What would be the channels and the messages uh, that uh, the population that comes to, uh, to the rescue of those animals should be uh, should be uh, given to uh, for them to understand how to better embed in um, in supporting animals during a disaster. Then Th there is, seems to be a communication lack here that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I'm going to go first on that one, Gerardo, because that's such a great question. And you know, probably the most successful response to that that I've had over the over the last couple of decades was when. We were down in Lake Charles. Um, we arranged to get on every single radio channel. There was some TV going on from outlying areas, but we got what everyone was depending upon was the radio. And I think we did six interviews in one day, and we just outlined what that process was. The very first thing we did, Gerardo, was to make sure that the community knew that their animals were safe. And that we were dealing with those issues because when there is a void there, when they don't think that is happening is when they will get involved. So looking for every opportunity, and now of course it's social media, we get that message out just as soon as we can. If we lose that internet connectivity, we drive somewhere where we can get it back and make sure that somebody from our office is getting an update on Facebook and all the different platforms. I'm certainly not an expert at that. To make sure that the community knows that these pets are being dealt with. And that stops a lot of that traffic and it stops a lot of that response. So awareness and messaging is absolutely critical. Adam, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's, you know, I think that's excellent. The, the only, the third thing, I would just add sort of, uh, you know, which goes along with the messaging is we found it's very helpful if, if you know, we can give give a, whether it's a telephone number or a, a email or a social media where people can report animals they're concerned about, right? So that also can, if they know that like, hey, we can call and say like, you know, I don't know, there's a dog chained up in, in the yard, you know, nobody appears to be there, then it can go through the proper channels. So it's it's sometimes hard, and I don't know if this is your experience, Dick, but sometimes, yeah, it's hard to get, oh, you can't always get the sort of like, um, you know, jurisdiction I spe um, to embrace this messaging about animals right away. And it's not that they don't care about animals, it's just that they're focused on 10 million things. And so it's always important also for like the EOC and stuff to understand why it's very important that people know, you know, where they can go to get supplies for their animals, where they can report if there's an animal of concern. And as Dick said, just to communicate um, on uh, what is happening with the animals. Um, and that that does, I think, help quite a lot. Yeah. No, that was brilliant, Adam. And I think that really it's just for folks to know that you're there and you're addressing the issues. Great question, Gerardo. Well, guys, always a pleasure to, um, to talk to you and uh, work with you. This has been a really interesting conversation that needs to be unwrapped and um, adapted to the different audiences. Uh, I can think, for example, of the chief veterinary officers in other countries. How do you uh, 
make them connect with civil defense and then and then how to connect with uh, civil society so i think there is a, there is a ton and a and a whole conference <laughs> that needs to be dedicated to this issue uh, based on the uh, good ex good and bad experiences uh, all of you have had um if there are no more questions i think i think this has been a pretty fruitful um event or discussion and um, I just uh, want to make sure that uh, Adam and uh, Dick are, have not uh, have not left anything in their um, presentations out for, for them to finish. Otherwise, I would invite uh, the audience uh, for the next session in about seven hours and remind you that uh, <clears throat> this event is free uh, to thanks to the generosity of our sponsors. And to keep it that way, we invite you to donate to our website, jadmc.org. Um, Adam and, and Dick, anything else before we wrap up? Yeah, Gerardo, that's so dangerous. I mean, you know that the two of us, we could talk forever, but I think we're good. Adam, would you slide those other ones just so the folks? Yeah, yeah. I'll slide them while I, uh, I'm just, just going to put in, you know, obviously, if you have interest in this um, topic, there are a number of other um pan there's a couple of other panels that are focused one's international one's maybe mm -hmm. australia new zealand if i'm if i'm remembering right that are that are also discussing this issue and then i'm actually giving a talk on sunday on this issue as well so there's a lot of discussion about it and i think it'll be very interesting to hear from these other panels also experiences in my experience in you know we've responded in many many countries and a lot of countries there's there's you know there's none of the sort of infrastructure that we have in the in the U.S. and and then it becomes even even more of a free for all. So I think that'll be an interesting panel. Um, Dick, go ahead if you want to say anything about these oh, other. I, I just missed, I missed that. I miss all that crazy excitement for sure. But I'll wait till I come back to Puerto Rico or excuse me, Costa Rica. That would be uh, a good thing you. You should do, but uh, we, you're not welcome without your dog, by the way. So All right, sounds good. <laughs> bear that in mind. And you have to walk there, Dick. <laughs> oh, I'm a pretty good swimmer. I will. We can take care of that. You can swim all the way to what? Uh, Hawaii. From here. Um, by the way, it's interesting. I just uh, we just had a, a, um, a presentation before you guys uh, about Ukraine. And um, last year, I was getting in touch with the uh, chief veterinary officers from Romania, uh, from Moldova, um, Poland, of course, and uh, there was no coordination there. You could see the need for them to uh, talk to each other and um, and, and plan. Uh, I say this because I am just uh, excited to uh, to uh, or hopeful that that all of you guys uh, in the uh, big NGOs start thinking about the future, uh, planning uh, how to reconstruct uh, after this invasion and how to prevent <clears throat> uh, for in, in future uh, uh, disasters such as this one. I, um, I am a believer that personally uh, that the Geneva Convention has some of the, uh, uh, of the main ideas for us to to start discussing farm animals uh, and, and how to avoid them becoming um, uh, military targets. But that is off the, the, uh, off the, uh, the subject here. I just think that you guys have the best ideas uh, based on the best experience on how to coordinate uh, civil society with, uh, with governments. And thank you again. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you.